We don't know what fair is, right? We do know that what we have now is, is probably objectively unfair to the creator, okay? To get to fair, I would argue, and I want panelists to chime in, that we need more direct buyer to seller Yep. setting of price, which will allow for market clearing price to occur without government intervention. And I deeply believe blockchain facilitates that. I want to thank in particular uh, Jack and Katja and, and Dean for, for putting this together um, and being, being really good to sort of stewards of, of these types of events. Um, these are important. Um, I do want to call out Dean in particular. Um, you know, as, as a lawyer myself, um, there, there's too much um, sort of law of no at this point. So hearing people sort of saying, particularly in the music space, let's figure out creative solutions, um, how we can all move this, this thing that we care so deeply about <laughs> forward is important. Um, uh, you, you, um, you can figure out my background if you want or care, but um, in, in a nutshell, um, um, I am a guitar player, started a guitar player, probably and a guitar player, but in the middle, um, started run a bunch of labels, including a, a relatively local label here called Ryko Disc a million years ago that was sold to Warner, then was one of the founders of a distribution company called TuneCore that some of you may be aware of, um, have managed artists from Carly Simon to Mark Isham, have a new startup called Music Audience Exchange that's, that's uh, venture funded, um, I have a consulting uh, company that works with sort of Fortune 500 to start up helping them with these types of, of challenges and innovations. Um, most importantly to me in my life is I do have the, the pleasure, I mean I think our lives are divided between things we get to do and things we have to do. And um, I, I get to be <clears throat> a, a professor at Berkeley and at Brown and, and that, that's sort of what, what keeps, keeps me going and keeps me moving. What I found um, in my life, and I think it's true of many people, is that, that at a certain point, you find something that, that tickles your brain, right, big or small, and, and that the things, your activities, are then just byproducts of those things that tickle your brain. And so my life, the things that tickle my brain tend to be technological innovations that foster art. Right? As, a, as an 11 year old, I started hacking away on a Commodore 64 computer and taught myself how to code. As a 47 year old this weekend, I coded together a Ruby on Rails app that, that um, I, you know, I may launch. So it never ends, right? It's that, that's the tickle the brain moment. Um, coding on a little Commodore 64 was a natural progression to sort of digital music workspaces, which is a natural progression to running the first CD only label, which was a natural progression to using technology to disintermediate distribution to allow for artists to get their music up onto iTunes without a, uh, without a label. Um, which was a natural projection pro progression to sort of 2007 when social media emerged in a, in a meaningful way. As Thomas Friedman has reminded us, 2007 was the year that Uber launched, not Uber, Airbnb launched, the iPhone uh, was introduced, Twitter launched, and Facebook came out of the, the academic setting. And that was the time where the tickle the brain moment was, hey, how do we disintermediate media? How do we go right from creators of content with as few people in between to consumers? And, and the byproduct for me has always been this helps creative class, creative people create more art in a sustainable way. That's the grail. That's the windmill that I tilt at. Three years or four years or so ago, um, I heard about blockchain tech the same way that everybody in this room did through Bitcoin, right? And, and I, I, it, it interested me, right? And, and that, that created a rabbit hole. Uh, another thing that I get to do is I get to write for Forbes and periodically for other publications. And so I just started writing about it, talking to smart people. And what became clear was the reason it was tickling my brain was because it became another layer of disintermediation, another way for people who create things, assets, music, IP, whatever, to distribute it out in a different way than the way that we have now. Um, we're in deep, fast acceleration mode in terms of Moore's Law. Things are happening faster now than ever. We've gone from blockchain tech that maybe two or three years ago no one was really talking about except for little nerds like myself and others on this stage, and I say that with great love, um, to now, man, 
you, you throw a rock anywhere and you hit somebody that's mid-blockchain talk, right? So if you compare that about the development of the internet, which really started in 1959 with DARPA, all the way then to Tim Berners-Lee and the WW layer of the stack, it was a much longer process. So things are accelerated. Um, the, the, the theme of tonight, this sort of security and, and expression and um, authentication, it is, is first and foremost a way in my mind, in the way that I construct it, for people to take these creative ideas and spit them out and spin them out and do it in a better way that gives more line of sight to creator and consumer. Um, I will say that for those people that are sort of skeptical about blockchain, as, as you probably appropriately should be, um, one, one sort of heuristic that I often use is that, that Bitcoin is to the blockchain as porn was to the internet, right? So too often you hear the first thing someone says, oh, what's blockchain? You say, oh, what's the, it's the technological substrate that, that allows for, for Bitcoin transactions. People go, oh, Bitcoin, right? Okay, you know, it's fine, right? I mean, you would have been wise to put money into Bitcoin a couple years ago, but, but that's okay. Um, whether the grand blockchain experiment succeeds or fails, and I think everybody now thinks that it will succeed on some level, um, the technological innovations that it's brought forth, or at least brought into discourse, whether it's just the notion of a distributed ledger, right, or the notion of smart contracts, which aren't legal contracts, but rather a set of machine-readable rules, or the notion of um, transparency and immutability. Those are important, and that toothpaste ain't going back in the tube. So what I want to get at tonight, and hopefully it'll be, that'll be the, the most I talk, is, is how we look at this from different angles. We've got such an amazing panel. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves. But um, one thing that I want to note about all of the people, my guests here, and I, I want to note two things. One, um, I violated my very first rule of panels, um, which is no mannels, um, no all-male panels. Um, it was not for lack of trying. Um, uh, we, we reached out to a lot of people. Now, certainly, we failed, right? Prima facie, we failed. We did not, we did not get any diversity on this panel. We will try harder. Um, I apologize for that. I just want to just say that. It was not for lack of trying. We still failed. We need more of that, and it's, it's wrong in 2017 to be standing up here with a bunch of white dudes. Um, so, sorry. Um, here we are. Um, so, the other thing that I want to say about the, the panels that I do have is that, that they are all doers, right? They are all makers. They are all people that, that have built things. Panos is, is a, just an unbelievable entrepreneur, an unbelievable connector of people, and, and really the true guiding light, not only of his chief concern, um, um, Berkeley ICE, which is the Institute of Con Creative Entrepreneurship, but also this project, which is a big part of tonight's event, the Open Music Initiative. I'll let Pano speak more about that, but that is a big thing. Um, Dan Harple, if I had an hour and a half, I couldn't scratch the surface. Um, I, am, I am candidly in awe of this person, not just of his intellect, but just the constant drive to do everything from set standards for VoIP to build music with, with um, Todd Rundgren and others. It, it, it's, it's staggering to me. And to do it in a way and continue to do it now when he kind of, I don't know, I don't know, it's always wrong to make assumptions about people's, you know, financial, but I can't imagine Dan needs to do it. But man, here he is, right? And, and like that, that's just amazing. Benji, um, founder of Pledge Music, musician himself, and, and another one of these true believers. Every, every new technology needs that group of true believers in what Benji has done with his talking about blockchain. And, and I'm so delighted and proud to have been like part of those conversations early on and watch dot blockchain go from those initial kernels of ideas and, and proud to have documented it in some of, some of our conversations about how maybe it intersects with VR and then grow into something that Man, you can't have a conversation about blockchain in the music business without dot blockchain coming up. So these are all people, and, and, and I sort of humbly put myself in this boat, that are true believers about this, and, and it's purely because we think some real good can come out of it. There's really no other alternative motive. So that's where we're here. I'll shut up. Um, any other sort of intros from you guys? Any other contextualization? I, I don't. I don't like the sort of traditional panel thing. So, if questions arise during these, just stick your hand up. You know what I mean? Like my job is to try to get to keep the conversation going, and it shouldn't just be a, us out here. So, if 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 things are unclear, 
let us know during it rather than at the end when it's like, oh, we got time for one more question. So, you know, Pontus, you want to you want to begin talk about OMI, talk about contextualizing this sort of the why of this. Uh, everybody can you hear me? Okay. Cool. I'm not crazy about these tables and kind of separates us from you. But, um, I from us too. Moving them halfway while you were talking, but <laughs> I'm a bum leg right now, so I'm going to attempt to not do that. Um, so, really quickly, uh, as George said, my name is Panos Panay. Um, I, I'm the founder of a company called Sonic Bits that I ran for 13 years. Um, came to Berkeley, started the Berkeley Institute for Creative Entrepreneurship. Um, very simply stated, our mission is to promote entrepreneurialism across the Berkeley ecosystem. Um, you may think, what does music have to do with, uh, with entrepreneurialism? Uh, well, none of our graduates finish and somehow go and get employed at Goldman Sachs. They all go out there and they're expected to create careers in an industry that's changing ever more rapidly. So if society's changing 10x, I can guarantee you that the creative, the music industry is changing at 20x. Um, so how do you create these mindsets and skills and behaviors and networks that need to go out there and make meaningful careers? That is what we aim to address with the Institute. Uh, as part of that, uh, we've been leading an effort that we launched uh, officially in, 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 in June of, uh, uh, of 2016. Um, Dan uh, was uh, a, a key component to us uh, deciding to undertake this. But um, Open Music Initiative is um, an initiative that's out of the Institute. We're doing it in collaboration um, with Dan's company, Context Labs, as well as the MIT Media Lab, the Digital Currency Initiative there, uh, Harvard Berkman Center, and a number of other academic institutions. But we are using our academic neutrality to really get the industry to come together and embrace this concept of creating an open protocol that enables interoperability across um, the music industry value chain. What the hell does this mean? Very simply stated, right now, the industry does not have a uniform way of identifying its most important um, player, and that is the rights owner or the creator of, the, of a piece of music. So think of all the ways that music is being um, uh, produced and consumed right now and the proliferation of all those platforms, whether those are streaming services or right now, whether it's VR or any number of the other places that we're able to consume music, traditional places, you know, radio, restaurants, live venues, museums, amusement parks, CDs, all these different systems have a ton of different uh, uh, platforms and databases that keep all this information that everybody says is proprietary, where the lack of sharing this information is causing, on a very conservative estimate, in the US alone, maybe 350 to $400 million not really being distributed to rightful owners. On a global scale, you're looking at billions, and that's just from money that is already <coughs> being uh, collected. Forget money that's not being collected, and that's probably the biggest issue that industry is having right now. So the aim of the Open Music Initiative is to address this issue. Uh, as I mentioned very quickly, we have 140 companies that have joined in. Um, everybody here is a participant, and these range from um, all the major record labels, streaming services, big news, the, the biggest music publishers, um, a number of the top collection agencies around the globe or performing rights societies, uh, over 40 blockchain startups. So it's a pretty massive effort. Um, Dan has been key in, in helping orchestrate the way that this uh, ecosystem is coming together. He can talk a bit more about that, but that's in a short nutshell what the Open Music Initiative um, is. Yeah, thanks, Panis. Um, so, so Dan, I mean, give give as much intro of yourself as you want, but but I also love it. I mean, I'm not sure. I assume people wouldn't be here if they didn't have some inkling of blockchain, but it's, it's always hard to know sort of where people are. It might be helpful for you to sort of define this notion of interoperability um, and why and how blockchain tech um, is, is relatable to that. And, and again, maybe do that through the lens of, of your career, however you want. Okay, sure. So I'm the oldest white guy on the panel, but I will identify however you want me to, George. So. I didn't make any age <laughs> distinction. Yeah, I just want I mean, you to feel comfortable. That I mean, the whole feel. notion of gender is clearly not binary anymore. So how you identify is up to whatever you. Whatever you want me to do, I am cool. Okay, so uh, I, I guess to step back on the whole thing, um, 
I start everything with sort of what I call the higher order bit. And I look at, from a technology perspective, how we can use technology to improve things. And I think everyone in here, this is MIT, and the mission of MIT is something that everyone's got to love. You know, if you, if you look at what Raphael Reif says about, about the Institute, that's what the purpose of this place is. And I, I kind of like to use that as a higher order framework. So this higher order bid for me is in my career, you know, in, in 59 when DARPA started, I was, you know, a newborn. But uh, in terms of the launch of the commercial internet, I was there uh, and part of Netscape in the early days. And we essentially invented the early streaming and early voice over IP stuff. So we saw that inflection point in the company there. Um, and I think what's happened, and I've done several companies through the years, so five or six companies, and I think the, the higher order bit I'd like to frame is what, I, I, some people have heard me talk about this, but it's, it's the pendulum of value. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'd kind of like to frame it with that. And here's the pendulum, and as it swings over here, this is the creative class. This is for the Richard Florida, inventors, mm -hmm. right, right. artists, musicians, engineers. As it swings over here, this is the, the, the distribution chain, okay? It's the supply chain. And what happened in the internet is the supply chain players entered and disintermediated. And I, I, in my view, did a massive land grab on value. So if you think about it, think about Amazon. So sort of didn't even, they sort of snuck into the book business, right, as, as a Trojan horse. But today, I don't know if most, pe most people realize this, but Amazon takes about 55% of every book sold. So I, I like to say, imagine if you bought something and the FedEx guy, you know, you bought this camera and the FedEx guy showed up at your house and say this cost $1,000 and the FedEx bill was 550 bucks. You know, I say WTF to that. So I, I, I think that's the higher order bit and I think this technology is the self-leveling mechanism that can swing the pendulum back. Yeah, I love that. And, and one of the things I do want to make note of is the, the optics here, I agree with you, Pan, is this sort of weird sort of Germanic circa 1500 floor plan um, <laughs> is only redeemed partially by the fact that there are some keyboards and things over there, right? And, and, <laughs> and, and so it, it, like when I get, well, I turn to that and I feel better that there's art. So to your point <laughs> about sort of the delivery mechanism and, the, and, and taking a, a big cut for that, and I've run record labels, so I'm not an apologist, nor, a, you know, I just, they just are. Um, that's what they did, right? They said, okay, we're going to charge this for this, and we're going to sort of like take, I mean, distributors, they took a, a big fee for that. So I appreciate that sort of higher level bid. Um, Can I add one, one quick thing? Of course. Um, you know, you're also looking at a fundamental societal shift with respect to what we consider value when it comes to content, right? Like, so we're well, about arguably music. we are in a post-transactional era of music. Correct, and music or, you know, I look at Instagram and I'm thinking, wow, there's, there's billions of people sharing willfully their content, right? And not one of them is making a penny out of it and somehow they're not asking, well, why am I not making any, any money, right? Yeah. But, as, as this uh, sort of societal shift is happening, you're also looking at fundamentally new ways that people are consuming, and, and as I said, creating music, those traditional roles of who's a creator and who's a consumer are completely blended, right? So it's somebody who took somebody's bass line and somebody's drum loop and another person's vocal and then insert them, you know, insert whatever their own creation is on that or a, a piece of video and share it out on social media, isn't that person a creator? Shouldn't that person somehow recognize some value? But then also, shouldn't some of that value be driven to the originators of some of those individual pieces of creation that, that this person used, right? Now, you can see that in that context, or you can see it in the context of remixes or mashups. So there's all of these new ways that we're experiencing and sharing and consuming and creating content that with the current pendulum swing, there's one group that's making a boatload of money from it, right? And those exactly. are the digital, let's call it the digital platforms. But then the actual creators yeah. are not somehow being remunerated for it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think for us, you know, this is the prospect that a technology like blockchain 
Yeah, and, and we do. We live in a, a post-scarcity world increasingly too, and I think that's important. But but turning to Benji, um, so Benji, I mean, I think you can bring you can build yeah. on that for sure, and, and maybe you can contextualize yeah. .BC and its evolving mission and sort of where you are as well. I mean, it's funny. Before we started here, I was I was having a conversation, and and I I was the musician first, so I co-founded Pledge Music, my first company, with that guy there, Jace, and. The, the concept really was that where the artists send their fans, there, is, there should be a return on attention. To your point, Panos, if I'm an artist and I send someone to Instagram, I'm giving great value to Instagram. What comes back before they had links out, before they had that type of thing? And so what I really saw early on was that there was an economy of, of, of direct connection between artists and fan that was unprecedented. Because in the previous incarnation, it was Musician would take music to record label, record label to distributor, distributor to store, store to human. And then they had to redo the entire thing again. And a friend of mine who's an artist said, I went to my label and said, can we just email the 500,000 people that bought my last album with a new track and uh, give them a pre-order link to the new one? And they said, no, we can't. We don't know who they are or how to reach them. We take it to distributor, distributor to label, label to, you know, et cetera. And, um, what, what I find fascinating is that if you can pull back uh, um, uh, scarcity, and scarcity, I believe, is created by permanence. So in a blockchain world, you can create a permanent record of something happening at a certain time and place. That is an absolutely radically revolutionary concept. And it's going to take a lot of time for that to sink in for a huge number of people in the same way that, that I know certain companies right now are just going to get their head around cloud. You know, oh wow, there's a, you mean, where does my file live? It's not on that box there? No, it's in someone else's box. How does that work? And William Gibson's quote about the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed, is really true. And so when we talk about what a blockchain can do in my head, the, the, the true potential is by stamping across a series of nodes, truths, informations, or information that can be built into a very, very high degree of truth, you can then turn around and create scarcity. And you can still, it doesn't, it doesn't limit abundance, but it creates the ability to create digital scarcity for the first time ever. Selling a limited edition of a digital work is extremely interesting. Very, very hard to do today. But I believe that we're going to a place where that can be possible. And for me, the interest is that um, I've tried to look at every which way a musician can make enough money to go on tour and get really good at what they do. If it's a DJ or if it's a, if it's a, a cellist in a classical band, it takes time to do that. So when me and, when our crappy band was playing, we were okay. If we hustled, we could make a living. We could make a living selling compact discs because they were hard to recreate. We could make a living selling stuff at shows and it worked. I think that, that the, this younger class of artists who are not necessarily social media savvy, but very, very good, but need time to develop are gonna have trouble unless we can create a, a system of rails that can adequately reward them for when things do go well. And I think that that begins with this idea of digital permanence and scarcity, um, because I, as an artist, may choose to create a limited edition of a song. David Lowry did it recently. He's like, I wanna create a digital a limited edition, and I don't want it on YouTube impossible to do, really. His reasons, we can question, but the point being, if, if, if that's his artistic expression, <coughs> is that valid today? To the same time, to Panos' point um, about the consumer versus creator, Nick Bilton talked about this. He said, I'm among the, the era of consumers and creators. He didn't differentiate between the two. We do both. And where I can't find the story I'm looking for, I will steal or create it. Just this, how, how he thinks. And what I loved about that was, um, I think the internet is, is billions of people trying to do the right thing with art. They are trying to, but there has been a, a, an issue with literally knowing who owns what and how to pay them at the core of it that, is, that I think blockchain will solve um, in, to Dan's great use of the term, in an interoperable system in which the machines can talk to each other. Yeah, I, w I want to chime in just for one second. I know Dan does as well. So, um, I love your sort of sanguine viewpoint about the internet wants to do good, and maybe that's true, maybe it's not. Clearly, undeniably, we're in sort of a, a 
troubling relationship with the idea of truth, right? Yeah. I mean, Pizza Gate, notwithstanding, whatever. Um, it, to Nick Bilton's quote that you're citing, if I can't find what I want, I'm going to steal it, I'm going to create it. Arguably, you could look at this recent election as a lens through, yeah, I can't find the news I want or the news that gets me the response I want. I'm going to create it, and if I yell loud enough, it becomes truth. Mm. We have, we have uh, you know, a, a code of rights in our country that we're governed by that does allow for freedom of expression, but increasingly, I do fear that, that the Internet needs to be governed in the same way that I can't go into a movie theater and yell, fire. And so blockchain may or may not be able to address that, but I think one of the key components of blockchain, one of the things that I've always talked about, is a sort of bugaboo of garbage in. If I put some garbage onto the blockchain in an immutable fashion and just keep pointing to that as mine, that's problematic. Yep. For those of you out there that are sort of trying to get their head around blockchain, one way to think that through is like Wikipedia. If I go to Wikipedia and I sneak something through the editors, and you really should question yourself, well, how do those editors know, right? Um, there is a change log. You can go back all the way through and see all the cruft of people putting misinformation or who knows what that term means anymore. So one way to think of blockchain's immutability as a series of blocks where the wrong stuff may be on there, but if you add other stuff over time, you may get to some version of truth or at least reputation. I know you wanted to jump in, Dan, and I know Ponish, you did too. Yeah, I was just gonna respond a little bit. Um, I think Benji really articulates kind of the, the end game super well and has built a platform to get there. And this panel is not so much about open music initiative in the OMI, but it's about transparency and it's about swinging that pendulum. And I, I wanted to frame it up a little bit on what the OMI is Please. and how its DNA actually is also part of MIT. Um, so as we went down this path, what shaped the, the structure of the OMI was some experiences I had in the standards for voice over IP and media streaming. Great. So there's a thing called the real-time streaming protocol. I was deeply involved in that process to get it there. And then as I saw this emerging as a tech, a new tech, I, I just realized it's not just the protocol or the technology that wins. It, it never is. It's adoption, right? Yeah. Well, there, there are tools to inform adoption. So uh, what really shaped this, uh, there's a, a professor here uh, named Roberto Rigabon who talks about this concept of a coordinating device. Mm -hmm. And that so resonated with something I had done years ago in streaming media. And then what we did is we intersected that with this program that's at Sloan now called REAL, Regional Entrepreneurial Acceleration Lab. And essentially it's a multi-stakeholder inclusive process. Mm -hmm. So we thought, okay, let's assemble the REAL environment for the music segment and let's use that as the coordinating device to shape an industry. And, you know, pa Panos is the best biz dev sales guy I've ever engaged with in my life. Agreed. Amen. And you just give him a playbook, <laughs> and he will score faster than you can, you know, keep track. You can also write the playbook. Yeah. Um, so what we did is we built the playbook, and what happened was we went out, uh, just to like a little flavor on this, you know, we've got over 140 members now. It stems from the large guys to the small guys. You know, you've got Spotify, YouTube, you name it. I mean, there's all the way down to Context Labs, blockchain, et cetera. Not, not enough artists, by the way. And there's a lot. So what we did was we went out to the labels, and the labels basically, well, we went to the RIAA, and they said, no one will ever join. <laughs> and we walked away thinking, wow, those guys are a bunch of assholes. There we go. You know? There like, we go. Now the panel like, gets not started. Even, signing up to giving a shit about their artist. So Paz and I were like, well, we're gonna get them, you know? So what we did is we went out and we basically, all the streaming players signed up, and eventually, every single major label signed up. So I think that speaks to the power of, of the, the ecosystem and the method. Or they're okay. just brain sucking us. Or what? They're just brain sucking us. <laughs> Go ahead, Paz. Yeah, well. <laughs> Um, well, I, I think it's worth to take a, a quick step back and understand kind of the makeup of, of, of this industry. Um, and, and George, obviously, this is this is your background. Maybe you want to give a, a short primer on <laughs> sort of the individual copyrights associated with every piece of music. Yeah, thank you. And the complexity. The, 
as the industry has become more complicated on the consumption end and on the creation end, I mean, we, like one of my things is that everybody talks about all the new platforms that were consuming music, which is one layer of complexity, but nobody talks about the fact that on my iPhone now, I have more powerful tools to create music than a full-fledged studio had just when I was a student 20 years ago, you know? So this is really creating a structure that is moving so rapid while you have a legal framework and um, sort of an, 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 indus an industrial architectural framework that's so old that there's a vast disconnect. And this, this is resulting in this tension that all of you are experiencing from even whether it's the inability to access music when and where you would like to have it. And everybody experiences this frustration one way or another. You know, it could be a documentary that you're watching that has cheesy cover music and you're like, why the fuck is this really bad music playing on top of this documentary, right? Um, or it could be a video that you uploaded with your kid singing some song that gets taken down, right? So everybody's experiencing this tension and it's manifested in media through all these losses that are happening. You know? So, so let, let me jump in. So, so um, there was a, there's a technology that invented and it, and, and it, it, it allowed for people to um, create an image um, and do something that, as technology always does, does something that, that once took a lot of time to be able to do, be done more quickly and at scale. So people got very excited about this and they started doing this lots and lots of times. And then somebody saw an original image that had taken somebody, uh, original item, that had taken somebody a long time to do. They took it and then they distributed it everywhere. And the person that created the original item said, well, you can't do that. And the court sort of said, well, wait, they're doing it in a new way. And we don't really know how to reconcile this. And maybe our laws don't accommodate for this new change in technology or whatever. Any lawyers in this room know that I'm referencing a case called Burroughs Giles from 1851 in which a photograph was taken, a lithograph was taken of Oscar Wilde like this and then put out there into the world. And someone said, that's cool. I can now reproduce this. And everybody's head exploded and said, we must create new rules and new laws and everything else. And we've been doing this and doing this and doing this over and over and over again. When we think of interoperability, there's certainly technological interoperability. There are APIs, there are various machines that can talk to each other. I will throw out a straw man out there that we could say that the six, league, five legal rights, you get five if you create a song, a composition, and you get, a diff, get the same five and a little bit of interplay between them for if you create the work itself. So Dolly Parton writes a song called I Will Always Love You. I will now perform that for you. Um, and Woo! then Whitney Houston <laughs> does a version of it, right? Two different rights. Those rights have stayed essentially the same for a really, really long time. They come under pressure. In 1988 or so, the Beastie Boys decided it to be a good idea to take the drum beat from When the Levee Breaks and throw it under a rap song. Right, put it out, and everyone went, I don't know what this could possibly mean. What is this? How will we possibly accommodate this? This is crazy. We need new laws. Well, eventually we put our heads together and said, no, there's an exclusive right that you get called the right of derivative work, and it's perfectly fine. I would say that we have a perfectly functioning, interoperable set of laws. Does that mean that they're easy to enforce? No. St. Ignatius has said that if you can't enforce a law, maybe it shouldn't be a law, right? I think the blockchain actually allows for us to see the interactivity and the interoperability and enforce them with the rule of law that we currently have. And I think that's a core functionality of this interoperability. So to Pontus's point, you could say, well, oh my Lord, I'm going to, this is, I love this. So I'm going to make a VR implementation and it's going to be the song, Don't Fear the Reaper, right? The more cowbell song. And when I put my headphone goggles on, I will see myself on a horse galloping along and there will be a reaper behind me and I'm running, right? That will be my idea. And, and people will say, how will we possibly license those things in? And I will say to them, well, you're probably gonna wanna sell it. That's a reproduction and a distribution, right? 
there's going to be probably some visual element that could be display. You're taking an existing work, Don't Fear the Reaper, and expanding it out into a new work. That sounds an awful lot like a derivative to me. And you might want to stick this up on a movie screen. That sounds like public performance. Tell me where the laws have to change to accommodate that, right? So we have an interoperable set of laws. I would like to move the discourse away from, and it's not so much on this table, but just out there in the world. Oh, well, we'll never be able to enforce all this stuff. I would counter that with, actually, we actually will be able to enforce yeah. a lot better now because we have line of sight. And, and just to speak to George's point, the size and scale of this. So SoundCloud has 140 million derivative works, apparently. YouTube has approximately 5 billion of something, but we don't know what it is. Um, and 3.9 million hours of derivative works alone are added to the internet a week. And I'll add one more thing. There's an article in Wire magazine uh, where they sort of deconstruct all the different ways that a global hit can bring in money. And uh, they actually look at a Taylor Swift song, and there's over 600,000 different lines of revenue that come in with respect to the way that this song is consumed on a global question. So you can start doing the math, and you can figure out how quickly this, this complexity is, is increasing. Yeah, so, I mean, man, I love you for raising your hand. I don't know if what the protocol here is. I think this is being broadcast, so we probably need a microphone somewhere. Is that, is that possible? You can come up here and use my microphone as far as I'm concerned. We can speak loud and we can or, repeat Or you it. can yell and I'll repeat it. Yeah, we'll do like an... Can you hear me if I yell? You, I can hear you really well, and, and I can repeat it too, so go ahead. So the, the, you were talking a little bit about interoperability of laws, and you didn't you say that that's okay. So I missed that. You're talking a lot about interoperability of laws and what? And even if you say that the laws are okay. Yes. The focus of the blockchain is creating this ground truth, but I don't think we've addressed the question of uh, what is the deserved value of the creator's work, even if they get through this entire chain or you know, path. Yeah, yeah, I love it. So, so one of the things that we hear a lot, and I want push Benji to push back on this, is this idea of sort of artists need to be compensated fairly. So I would argue that, that you know, we're in an era now where we're going, as I mentioned, from this idea of sort of modeling, guessing, in the same way that your gas reader would come out twice a year and say, well, you use this much during this period, we're going to extrapolate that out to measure it. We know exactly how much gas you're using, right? The music industry has had to do a modeling approach. If your music gets played in a public space, we can't possibly police to know what that is. So we've decided as a society that we're going to allow the government to set standard rates for certain things, right? I won't go into all the details. The problem with that is that any time intervention comes in and sets a market rate, you don't have free market. You don't know what it is. I think we could probably, everybody in this room, agree that we have, we, we don't have, we don't know what fair is, right? We do know that what we have now is, is probably objectively unfair to the creator, okay? To get to fair, I would argue, and I want panelists to chime in, that we need more direct buyer to seller yep. setting of price, which will allow for market clearing price to occur without government intervention. And I deeply believe blockchain facilitates that. And in, but the problem is that the incumbents don't want that. And I, mean, I can speak from the, from the sort of, the conversations with artists that I've had for a long time around this are, a lot of them will say things like, and it's the argument of, I don't want my song used in a Donald Trump rally. I guess they're just presidential rallies now, weird. Um, but so they'll state that this is a fact. Where do they write that down? Where can a, when a, where can a creator say, this is what I want? There is no place to do that. Uh, because there's no place of permanence today, in which you could do it. It would have to be in someone's database. So if you were to say to your publisher, hey, listen, write down on a piece of paper somewhere that this song is not to be used in this place. And then anyone in this room takes that song, goes Apple Eye, puts it into a, into a list, remixes it, and pushes it out in Donald Trump rally. That just happens. And so one of the things I think is fascinating is, and, and what I've been working towards is, um, if you can create a digitally permanent layer in which an artist can, A, prove who they are as a user, B, authenticate other players to the song, and then C, enshrine within the DNA of the song itself certain rule sets. Then what you can do is you can enforce them because you can create a digitally smart song, if you will. And the way to view it is, is today, if I take my song to an aggregator, aggregator takes it to iTunes, and that rate is set out there. But if I write a smart song, and I encode within that song, that file itself, 
And I, instead, of, instead of saying, here's the song, now distribute it, what I do is I say, here, you have permission to access the music at the rules written down within the song. And this is the blockchain that authenticates that I am who I say I am and these are the parties to it. Then what you can do is it's up to the, up to the, the platform to decide, yes, I'd like to have that at that rate. No, I wouldn't. So what will happen is, is you'll give certain creators the ability to write not just the works themselves, but how they wish their outcomes to be there. In the early days, that was called DRM, Digital Rights Management. Bad, bad word to bring up when you're, when you're talking about in the music industry. What I refer to as is digital rights expression, which is that if you as a creator can write down what you would like to happen, it's not legally binding today, right? But as George points out, if there are laws and if there is machine readable code that could execute outcomes on a public permission blockchain, on a public blockchain, then what you have is a state where you go, okay, this is the genetic proof of the song, this is where that song resides, and this is how it gives its ability to work um, uh, uh, with p partners, creating that interoperability layer. And so I think what will happen is, is the laws can then all of a sudden gravitate to it. But, you know, uh, to, I get an ask app statement once a quarter, and it just says use. Yeah. Well, that's some, what does that's that mean? Modeling, so. You know, so, yeah, I, so I'll push back a little bit. I mean, sure, it, it, I mean, this is my taco shop analogy that I've been writing about for 10 years. But, um, but the, the, of, course it's, it, of course it's legally binding. If you, I mean, this, for those of you that are having trouble getting your head around it, some of you may know the Creative Commons license, where you say, okay, I will allow my work to be used if you do it in this way, right? Creative Commons license. The problem with the Creative Commons license, such as it is, it's not machine readable. What Benji's proposing is a set of rules that you can say, and then those people that want to use the song can use it if they adhere to those rules. It, it, we don't need to change our law to do that. That's a contract issue, not, not a governmental one. Dan, can you, can you, can you provide, um, you've got such interesting perspective. I mean, how does this grow? Like, where does it go? I mean, if you could, and I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm asking you to predict the future, but, but you have a unique, perspective on how standards and interoperability, that the sort of flywheel effect that I think we're looking for. Like, mm -hmm. what are the stumbling blocks? How does it, what does it look like a year from now, two years from now? Based on, based on other, I mean, you know what I mean? Again, I'm not asking you to predict the future. I just like, how would, how would you view I'm the I'm really lens? bad at doing that. You know? uh, I, I would argue, I mean, like 20 no, years too not, early on everything I do. 20 years too early, okay. Yeah, yeah, so I, I think the coordinating device, the OMI, accelerates the adoption. And it's not just about the technology. So in the OMI, we focus on policy. We focus on education. The, uh, as an example, uh, the, the hosting for the OMI is, is a neutral place, Berkeley College of Music. So it allows stakeholders everywhere to, to show up and participate. So I think that matters a lot. You know, We had a, a session at, at the Berkman Center like a month ago or two, two months ago or whatever. Um, but there's, there's layers of this. There's, there's policy. There's the, uh, the copyright stuff. At the same time, I think what we're starting to focus on now at OMI is, is the blocking and tackling thereof. Okay, so we, we've, we've actually created a, a massive hybrid of a standards process that's not like any other standards process. It's a best practices of uh, W3C, mm. Apache, Mozilla, all these things blended together, which we say different by design. Can, can, can I interject a question? I don't want to ruin your flow, but some of those standards worked, got adopted, some didn't. My thesis is the market sort of dictates, right? I mean, MP3 is a suboptimal standard when compared to an AIFF, and yet MP3 wins. VHS is a suboptimal standard when compared to Betamax, and yet VH wins because there's porn, right? Um, so what, what, are the, what are the requisite requirements of standards that we need to be conscious of as we try to guide this forward? Well, I think the market always wins. I think what we can do is shape the adoption of the market. So I think what doesn't work is a massively top-down standards approach. Mm. And what we've done here is build a grassroots standards approach. And grassroots starts with the artist, all the way through the supply chain to the pendulum swinging way over here. And you know we've got the guys who do the stuff way over here who take all the margin participating too. So I, I'd say uh, when we got people to join the OMI, Panos and I talked about what I call the strategic imperative. Okay, so say you're, you're Spotify, and what's accrued? $300 million or something, the lawsuit and everything? So 
there's money that they have that they claim they don't know who to pay. Mm -hmm. My point is you have a strategic imperative to participate, at least from a PR perspective, to show that you care. You know? So I, I, think, I think there's a mechanism that allows the acceleration of, of a standard. I don't think a standard can be driven just from the top down. Perfect. I, I'd like Hannes to jump in, and I want to hear what you, I know there's a question, but, but I'd like you to frame it more from the sort of, you've been out there actually talking to people and getting them to buy into that. I'd love to get some you know, input. I mean, on one side on the artist, sure, the artist that's not un, that's unfettered, they think, sure, I'll do this. Those artists that are getting checks from whoever, it's a different conversation. So can you talk about what you've yeah. confronted, and then yeah, I'll circle I'm right I'm actually going to build a bit on, on Dan's point. You know, you guys heard, and I know an hour, it's a short time to give you a primer in the music business, a primer in blockchain, a primer on standards, and all that stuff. We're doing cold but, fusion but, later. You know, <laughs> you're beginning to get that this is an industry that um, obviously is going through rapid change. Uh, there is built-in complexity, some of it intended, some of it unintended. There's a ton of revenue leakage. Um, there, there's a host of issues. You know, we talked about a hit having 600,000 different ways of making money. We talked about uh, derivative work. So this complexity is increasing. And on top of that, it's an industry that's been shrinking in, in revenue. So a lot of complexity, shrinking business, a ton of intermediaries. I mean, this, this obviously is a situation that enables not only money to go missing, but also it's, it's rife for lack of transparency, right? now. We are at a and, and point. to be clear, some of that lack of transparency is because a of contracts and NDAs, and some of it is for business decisions. I, I like to say yeah. that it's it's a feature, not a bug, largely in the music industry. But, um, however, we are finally at a tipping stage, where I, I was having a discussion with somebody today. You know, there used to be that there's perpetrators and victims. Now almost every actor is both a perpetrator and a victim of one way or another, you know? So take the record labels. They're both perpetrators with respect to this lack of transparency, but they've also become bigger and bigger and bigger victims with respect to how this pendulum has swung. Then you go on the other side of the spectrum, there's the Spotify's of the world where they're perpetrators because they're saying, well, you know, we don't know who to pay, so therefore they're not paying, you know? But on the other hand, their public um, you know, relations uh, uh, stance is taking a big hit. And if you want to look at the history, people are saying, I don't want to be Napsterized, not just on the label side, but on the company side. Napster is not really around anymore. I mean, it's around in one creation or another, but it's not really there. Then, of course, you have the artist, as well as the consumer, and they're both perpetrators and victims, as far as I'm concerned. There's a consumer who's demanding more and more for less and less, and there's an artist who wants a bigger and bigger reach but somehow wants more money. So there's this tension built in that finally, I think the reason why we're here and we're seeing this breakthrough is because everybody's saying, look, and this was a bit my pitch, you know, we're not gonna agree on everything as an industry, but there's this one thing that we all somehow seem to be caring about. So why don't we just focus on this one thing? So when we get these people in a room, people who traditionally are suing each other, don't wanna to talk to each other, uh, in some situations, I've never been in a room together. The reason why we're all there is because people are beginning to sense two things. It's time for us to embrace this concept of, of a shared infrastructure, whatever that may look like. And two, if we get ahead of this as an industry in its totality, which has never happened, the industry, you know, we tend to think of the music industry as this monolith, but it's really multiple industries yeah. that kind of playing the same field. You know, somebody who's in the live music production business and somebody who is making software for sound recording and somebody who's in the music management business or a record business, they're in to or a publishing business, they're totally different industries. You know, the only one thing that they have in common is that creator and that consumer, right? So I think people are saying, if we get ahead of it, then we can see how we get back to growth. <laughs> and I think at the end of the day, people are, are motivated by two things survival and profit mode. You know? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say that, that my line is there is no more music industry. There's a technology industry that sometimes looks at music. I would also say that the Frank Zappa album keeps coming through my head called Ship Arriving Too Late to Save a Drowning Witch, but we shall see. You had a question. Those 
events that are recorded, mm. everything is recorded, you know, and then um, all the way through to the steps of consumption. And the second part of the question was sort of price and value. So somebody at some point says, I'm willing to pay something for this song. Then how does that distribute it back across I'm all sure. the factors? That question could be a symposium, by the way. So, <laughs> yeah. so I can give you a fast one if you want. So basically, I'm in the studio with some friends. We haven't agreed who's written what part of the song, but we're recording together and the vibe is good. We've got plaid shirts on. We're all, we're all happy, right? <laughs> <laughs> then what happens is I send um, uh, a copy to my manager. I might email my publisher and say I've written a song with my buddy. And then that publisher may register that with a PRO. Now the music's still on the hard drive. The Writer information is nebulous because we don't know who's written what. There's no standard place to go look for all that information. Uh, you can apply for a code for that, but it takes two weeks to get a code that will say this is what that song, who wrote the song. You know that you have to apply. Correct. Then, uh, and, and the website is extraordinary to do so. Then the second side of that is, is the performers of the work are then sending it out. So you've got hundreds of different copies and different versions of this song all over the place. Finally, it coalesces around a, a finished master in the mastering studio. Um, once that master is created, it's then sent out through sometimes FTP, upload to an aggregator, a label takes it to a distributor, on and on, and it just goes everywhere. It's a chaotic model. And then the process of whack-a-mole happens where you can try and find it in all the legal places pretty easily. It's all the other places where, no, legal is the wrong word, all of the um, traditional places, you know, um, uh, Apple, um, Amazon, et cetera, those are quite easy. YouTube, if it's altered in any way, it may not pick up that it's that version. And all songs have this one thing in common. The file version itself, the one you create, can be altered at any time by anybody who has their hands on it. So you have, no matter how good the information you get is, you can never, reify the correct information to an original song. And then there are these repositories all over the world of songs. So Seven Digital has one, MediaNet has one, and a bankrupt company called um, Omniphone used to have one, but that's gone now. So the literal, uh, YouTube has one, obviously, and so others. So um, there is no real place to do that. There are business rules that, that dictate how and when things should happen, but the process is massively informal. And for creative reasons, that's actually very good when you're in the studio. You don't want to sit there and deal with who's written what when. It just it kills the vibe. Um, but at the same time, I think that's where software comes in. Well, and Benji, you're just I mean, Benji, you're just describing the digital consumption yep. of, of, of music. Let alone so, the physical barcodes. Let alone and, every no, time you walk performed. into a restaurant, yeah. there's music getting played. Right, that restaurant pays a fee for that that goes to, you call it a PRO or performing rights organization that is supposed to keep track of all these songs and then somehow pays you and you get a check and you're like, why is it 83 cents? You have no idea, right? So, you know, you're looking at an industry where the creator or the owner of something doesn't really have any good understanding of where this good is being distributed and consumed. You know, like there's no magic dashboard right now that somehow I wrote, you know, a piece of music that's somehow being consumed everywhere. It's streamed on, on a Netflix movie, right, or it's in television, or it's in an ad, or in radio, or in a restaurant, or it's in an elevator getting played, or it's in a phone through a ringtone, whatever it is, right? There's nowhere I can go and be like, show me all the places that my song is being consumed in real time. Now, we believe that this is possibly in 2060. Yep. It was possible, it, was pro it probably has been possible for a number of years. That doesn't exist right now. And that means that you've ceded entire control of your ability to make money from this to a series of intermediaries that are really not responsible or accountable in any way to give you some true remuneration of what you're supposed to get paid. They, they, are, they, are, they do have a fiduciary duty and they breach it um, you know, aggressively. Um, we we are moving just to a line from my friend um, Bill Ty. Um, we are moving from an era of unstructured data to structured data. We see this everywhere we go, right? We see this in the human genome. We see this in the countless amount of data that Facebook is pulling in and then finding a way to structure it to make money. We see it through Internet of Things. 
Um, I, I don't believe that, that there's any question in anybody's mind that we will begin, and maybe a different term, but we will begin to blockchainify physical objects, right? And we will be able to blockchainify little fractional elements of things. It may be a different terminology. All that means to me is we'll be able to keep track of them at the sort of atomic level, right? Once, once that occurs, not only will we be able to keep track of all, the music industry has a wonderful ability to make their business sound like it's the most complex thing in the world. Call NASA, right? I'm not saying it's easy, but there are more complex businesses yeah. than the music business. Yeah. There really are, right? Um, and, and so being able to get line of sight around all those things, and then to your second point, to get remuneration, that occurs, they're, they're tied together, right? Well, how is this being used? And how, do, how much do I want to pay for it? There are blockchain companies right now, we started this conversation about sort of ascribing provenance to either physical goods or, you know, it becomes on this atomic level and people think this is a Herculean task that cannot be done. Well, no, because we're not going to do it. Machines are going to do it. And there's companies out there, an OMI signatory, that is using um, technology not dissimilar to sort of, uh, what do you call it, YouTube's music match, to identify things that the chain has been broken. As Benji says, I changed from .mp3 to .aiff. The DRM's gone, but there are other ways to identify it, right? I mean, I could stick a Shazam up in this building right now and know what's playing with 70% accuracy. PROs are at about 30% accuracy. Go ahead. I'll let some Dan take yeah, it because I'm getting you. Know, um, yeah. And what I'm kind of curious about, you know, it seems like what the challenge here is that, you know, we're trying to build, take Boston as an example, tunnels under an already fully built, thriving city that, you know, doesn't really want to take a break. And you know, there's a ton of music out there, there's a ton of young artists that are putting out music already successfully, and you know, finding a way to actually pitch this integration as a seamless transition that still allows a big corporate money machine to you know, fund itself and operate in its manner. That's the kind of disconnect here. Technology seems obvious, but the transition doesn't seem so. Yeah. That ties in with the question you asked me about predicting the future. Yeah. Okay, so I'll make sort of a prediction. Historically, the market has driven everything. The big gorilla has rolled over and everyone goes with the gorilla, right? So I'll give you an example. Uh, today, IBM made a big announcement about Hyperledger. IBM uh, has swarmed the Hyperledger, you know, and you know, when they first uh, contributed code, they firehosed the Hyperledger group with their code. So th that's kind of your example, right? And what we've done in the OMI is we, what we've done is we've, looking at, we've looked at uh, kind of an architectural stack and what we decided to do is call the blockchain layer the substrate. And we build interoperability on top of that. And that interoperability should allow us to move our platforms around you know, to a Hyperledger environment, to an Ethereum environment, et cetera, right? So we've, we've done that on purpose. And in so doing, by agreeing, that the, prior to this, everyone has talked about the MVD, you know, minimally viable data. We, transform that to be minimally viable interoperability. So we set up the OMI, and essentially, there are five major working groups, and they've defined what a system should be. But the thing is, we're not building a system. You need to define what it should be so you can define its interfaces, and its interfaces, those APIs is where things become interoperable. So this is, I think, how we're going to fight Big Brother coming down and saying, oh, use the Hyperledger, because I've got 87,000 engineers at IBM. I mean, I, I think clearly, and you know, I'm not trying to say anything bad about IBM, okay? But I spent my whole career fighting Big Brother. And 
I, I think that this is a, this, once again, it's the coordinating device that allows it, us to do that because the players who, who actually control the catalogs, so your, your question was the catalogs. So the largest catalogs, let's, let's like universal, yeah. largest catalog in history or in the world, yep. maybe. Yep. Sure. Okay, so as they adopt the MVI standards we have, that floats all the boats and allows innovation to happen. So I, I think it's a really unique mechanism. Uh, I'm going to let you chime in. To, to, let me give a, a more a different approach. I agree. But a different <coughs> approach. Read the innovator's dilemma, if you haven't. Right? Yeah. These big incumbents that lose track of, of, <coughs> the la of their customers because there's so many layers between them, Hillary Clinton, get snuck up upon by those on the margin, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. Pontus, please. Uh, the one quick thing I'll add, this is why from the beginning, you know, we approached it and said, this is not a, I, I'm a believer that technology only does things that people want to do, you know? Um, and we said, this is not a technology issue, because the technological solutions have existed about any number of, you know, human problems. It doesn't mean that they themselves yeah. solve, solve them. We said, this is, this is fundamentally a political will issue. You know, and this is why we have hope that the initiative, which is, you know, really a, a pan-industry initiative, can bear fruit because of the multiple players that are involved. And, we're, you know, part of our work has been how do we create a shared identity for an industry that has never really had one? You know, somebody working at Avid, which is the software company that enables musicians to record music, right? And somebody working at Sonos aren't never talk to one another, you know? So I, I think our attempt here is to create something where we're saying, look, as an industry, we have shared interests, and this is a forum for us to, to come together to agree on some shared information that benefits us all. And when we started this, uh, one second, when we started this, the RIAA did pull me aside several times and said, can you please stop talking about this fucking blockchain stuff? You know? Like, we don't want to hear, our members don't want to hear about it. We don't want to hear about it. And, you yeah. know, we start calling it distributed ledgers. We start calling it whatever, you know. Uh, in the end, we're calling it an open protocol. It doesn't matter. I mean, right now, I think we're beginning to see that that tide is, is shifting. But you know, by no means are we declaring. So, and, and I think, Finji, please. please. I, I think it's also about, like, there's a, there's a stick, right? There's a carrot and there's a stick approach. And, and to me... I think that if you give the artist the ability to create a work in which it can define parameters and in which it tags, you know, I'll, I'll go to this in a presentation, I don't know if I can get to it, but like in which you can tag your rights holders. So I can create a song, mm. I can tag Universal. So the question isn't to Universal, do you want to use this system? The question is, Someone's made a declaration of truth about one of your works. Do you want to accept it, which means it's true? Do you want to ignore it, which also means it's true? Or do you want to deny it? So much like if I tagged you, I'm going through my slides in my head now, much like if I tagged you in a photograph, right? If you accept that tag, it's the truth. So one of the things that I think the, the, that this industry is going to require is the carrot is, hey, there's more money over the horizon if everyone gets involved, right? The stick is the first time an artist declares themselves in this system and starts tagging their PRO, their label, their publisher, and that publisher ignores that claim in an open distributed ledger system, that publisher has a problem. The problem is that someone else can come along and say, hey, I'm Sony Music ATV, I'm Sony ATV, or I'm Universal Music. So one of the, the approaches that, that you know, we took from, from day one in the project I'm working on is, is to say, not, not do you want to do this, what happens when it, when it, go, when it deploys? Because I've created a, 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 one of these things, one of these song files. I've created it, and I can tag ASCAP today. And right now, they would get an email from me saying, hey, and guess what? Benji's tagged his song. Do you want to approve his IPI number? So I think that, that like, to, to Pamela's point, interoperability, once you define what that, what that kind of standard is, is going to have to have a stick. And to me, we give the artists the stick. Because for the 35 million songs that have an immensely huge value today, let's consider the 70 million being created out of a door a digital audio workstation coming tomorrow, 
at 90 miles an hour because that will be bigger than the entire recorded music industry today in the next 10 years. So I, I, think, I, I think, you know, um, we have to ask ourselves, like, what motivates a company? And there's, there's profit, which is awesome, but there's also someone gets fired if you don't answer that claim. Some, like, like, you're in trouble. Do you want to be the biz dev person who's saying, well, or you, I just thought we'd ignore it. Or you, you know? get sued. Yeah. You're breaching your fiduciary duty. Yeah. There, there is some, a, a whole host of questions. Oh my gosh. Uh, I don't, yeah, go ahead. Yes. They joined, yes. <laughs> to, to, to. <laughs> but what's your, what's your, what's your question? We didn't say Berkeley would host it. Well, Berkeley is the convener of the OMI. We actually envision n number of blockchain implementations that are interoperable. That's the idea. And also, I think the concept of, I mean, we can get pretty technical on the minor aspect, but it's in some sense, we're looking at permissioned distributed blockchains, right? Um, and that brings up a whole host of issues about transparency because there's not, I don't believe there's utter transparency through the whole thing because it's defined by your contractual relationship. That's exactly right. You know, so so we, we have a binary relationship with, with transparency where too much about blockchain is, oh, it's all open in the public. That's just not true at all. You, yeah. you think of a blockchain as a mailbox on the street. You can put a lock on it or not. Where I thought you were going to go, and I think it's, it's worth bringing up, um, you know, the Bitcoin blockchain is constrained at the current fork in terms of, of in terms of scale and speed, right? There are now, obviously, because of business reasons, lots of companies out there that are building blockchains that don't have similar constraints, and we're we're looking at them all. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there are other hands. Yeah. You started me out with scarcity. We're yep. in the studio. We record. Great song. I get to register it before you do. Yes. How does blockchain handle Great. Uh, something like, well, you know what? I think I wrote the lion's share of it. Yep. I'm going to take it home. Yep. My song. How, how does it, how do, how do we handle how it now? Do, how do we handle it now if I... you be able to eliminate... So, uh, no, no I, I made an explicit point of saying that, that legalities is the ultimate interoperability. So, Hang on. Okay. If, I, if I decide that I'm going to write a song and it's Single Ladies by Beyonce, I will get a copyright number for that. However, if I go and try to use that, Beyonce <laughs> will sue me. Register with whom? With Bitcoin. How you, you don't... Do you, It doesn't. It doesn't. If you stick it up there and you're committing fraud, I will sue you. You can use your blockchain registration as evidence in the same way as people used to mail themselves songs for poor man's copyright. But it's a better record. It's a better record for evidence. So I think I, I answering your question. Yeah, exactly. Well, so you guys answered I think the question is blockchain's not a panacea. I mean, what it does, it's a ledger of stuff that happens, and it's time-stamped. So, That's you know, said, it, but it's yeah, in, ben, in Benji's example, a bunch of guys in plaid shirts are hanging yeah. out making music, but guess what? It's probably Benji's band, yeah. right? So, and maybe so I'm drunk. a side man in that band, <laughs> so there are roles, and this are essentially in computer science land, these are ACLs, right? So I will have ACLs in my permission blockchain, I will have a role, mm -hmm. and I will register whatever I do at a particular timestamp. And look at the blockchain. I like to call it a substrate, because that's all it really is. It's not a database. I didn't, so, you you so, did that. I, I kept my I damn just mouth shut. It's a way to record a, transactions. If I could share a, a concept. So one of the, um, the, the way I envisage the blockchain substrate is that there'll be a series of plugins to the top of it, right? So your label, your performing rights organization, your publisher, 
your manager, et cetera, will have a way of accessing stuff. So if you were to take the song that you're mentioning, right, and in order to get into your workstation, you've authenticated because you bought a copy of that, right? So that's, that's one level of authentication. So you create a user level authority to say, I am this person. I verified it through my Facebook and Twitter OAuth. That's me. So you get an identity score of, let's say, 80 out of 100. Then you start to create a song. So that song, when you begin, you, you, you assert, I own 50%, and George owns the other 50. And you tag him, Facebook style, in that song. Now, if he accepts that tag, great, 100% of the song represented. So the song, therefore, has an identity score of, let's say, 25. But if you then tag your PRO, your PRO represents another 25 points because they agree you are that person, this is the song, we can verify it. And you've sent through the, th through the track itself permission to that PRO to verify the information. The same thing with your publisher, same thing with your label. So what you do is you create a web of truth around the song. So that at the, at the end It's just point, evidence, man. Yeah. It's so just Spotify, evidence. It's so not legally binding, it's just evidence. So when Spotify says, I won't accept a song unless it comes from a proven source and the blockchain is the change log, is where you, where you track the changes that happen that built to user level authority and song level authority. That, but remember that the PROs, the former rights organizations, labels, and publics can work together on the songs that they have authority in to figure out and cleanse the data if they know what the song sounds like and who the originators are from the Genesis block. Because to George's point, if, if you go in and register single ladies, imagine trying to prove to Beyonce's PRO and label and publisher and co-writers that you are Beyonce. Looks like her, but you know, doesn't seem you, so good. I mean, so <laughs> the one feature that it adds George to help like your Beyonce. case is this immutability <laughs> quotient. Whereas in databases now, PROs, they can change the data. And that's why I actually explained it better. It's, it's the provenance. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that's why yep. there's a group of us all the way in the back. Yeah, just to follow up exactly on what you're talking about, do you envision that being a self-governing community? Yeah, it's going to, I mean, look, self-governing, however, we have rule of law. I, I don't know how to put it any other way. I, because, you know, it sounds a lot like America, what you're talking about. A lot, a lot like America? Yeah, it doesn't sound like a global enterprise where there's different no, we have a Berne Convention, we have a Treaty of Rome that most so, industrialized countries have signed that honor copyright. So the blockchain, for some people, represents an opportunity to rethink all of that. No. And to, yes, it does. And to no, it think doesn't. about so, communities of people, in this case musicians, who can be anywhere in the world, who can then be part of a self-governing group where, in fact, the governance structure is written by the people who are in the group. No, so none of that is correct. So, we have, we have a technology that people can avail themselves of, and if they commit fraud or if they violate Copyright Act statutes, there is remedy at law, whether you're in Brussels or in Denmark or United States. There's, can I make an analogy? So one of the things, that, when I think about copyright, and I use this example a lot, I would make a wax disc, put some paper on it that said that's what's on that. And that's fixing it in a tangible form, like it's a physical form. What's the digital equivalent of that today? Right? The digital equivalent of that is, is I can create a file and I can replicate it endlessly whilst changing the information endlessly. Whatever permission obligations built into the file can be removed. So how do you fix a digital asset in a tangible form? So if you look at like, the nature of copyright, I believe is still, like, let's figure out what the digital tangible form is. Perhaps a it's... A download, a stream. Yeah, or or I mean, perhaps we've, we've what it is... We've already decided. We don't need to figure that out. It's already been is, decided. But it's the creation of it. And then what you would say is, is right, let's, let me tag the copyright office with this work. Now that it's reached user level and song level authority, tag them. They are then a, a, a custodian of that node that performs the copyright office's function in the US. The only function the that the places. copyright office performs is that unless and until you register with the copyright, you can't bring suit. What do you want them to do? They don't police anything. Well, I understand. But what I'm saying is, I'm saying is, is, I think the gentleman's question was to the nature of what's this going to change. I think it will change the way in which the copyright office is going to access the works as they're created. If that's helpful. Yeah. Just to follow up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, an example in, in financial industry has to do with currency conversions. Right? Great. 
And so it's opened up new opportunities to think about how money can now move. Love it. And so the question that I'm addressing, or the, what I'm asking you about, is into this near future, because things are happening so quickly. But, is, but, this, but, is this intellectual property, in this case music, able to move in ways that, see, challenge those existing systems? Yep. No. In the, sense that, in the sense that cryptocurrency is challenging the way people think about financial things. Is it, though? If I steal cryptocurrency from you, what's your remedy? The, the, the question really, I think, is more about the idea of self-governing communities. No. And how people can come together and decide to do peer-to-peer contracting because blockchain allows... How will you enforce that peer-to-peer -peer contract? The communities are in control. B governed by what? Standards. Self-governing communities. What is that? That's, a, that's like, uh, that's an abstraction. The self-governing communities would have to have a set of lo laws in order to define how they enforce things. We have those. The, the example in finance would be the difference between Ether, say, and Bitcoin. No. If I steal Ether, Ether from you, you the, will sue me. No, and the fact that there are now hundreds of coins out there. So and if I steal so from you, your remedy is at law. The, so the example is still, might there be, for example, a self-governing community that has their own currency, their own music coin? There are. And there if are. you and I come up with a currency together and you steal from me, I will sue but, you. You know, I, I'm not interested so much in, in suing. Which is, you just don't like my answer. You want no, no, I, I don't think that suing is really the point of interest here. The, the point of interest is whether or not people can control their property. And, and there are lots of ways to do it besides going to court. And, and that's, that's, you know, that's why I said it sounds American, because we litigate here so freely. But and there are there are sharing communities where litigation is not the primary interest of the participants. Yes. Um, thank you for talking about the technology aspect of it and transparency and all of that is very important and interesting and is clearly going through a lot of development. Um, I'm curious how you guys have been thinking about working with existing record companies, the big old guys who have pretty much died. Who used to be in charge of creating high quality content? They haven't um, died. Who used to be big in marketing everything? Who used to make this industry go? Um, now we have a situation where they are basically castrated and have very, very little way of making money. So, um, and so we have an, both an exciting opportunity for new artists to come up, which is great, but how do we ensure and continue some? maybe even a, a happy medium way of producing high quality uh, music outside of, say, The Voice and whoever picks up that person. I mean, that's just, uh, um, I wanna, you know. I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer. A, a couple of things, because I want to clarify some things about open music. So uh, Benji's company is a company that's part of the initiative. We are not mandating as an initiative any specific implementations and or, or even mandating specific, you know, standards. Our view is that if we come to an agreement around this, um, you know, this open protocol, then you enable innovation to flourish. And similarly, we were having this discussion in 1993, 94 about the internet. It would be impossible for us to predict where we are right now. Um, and I'd like to believe that that's been a good outcome. We're taking a similar approach yeah. here. We don't really know what innovation will bring about and to your self-governing communities, you know, uh, point. I think that's the beauty of, of, of what we're facing. We don't really know how people will organize, how things will be governed. We don't know what new art forms will, will come about or how music will, will be marketed or who will fund it. What I do know is that um, as an initiative we have made an attempt, and I believe a successful attempt, to bring the bigger players. I definitely believe that the role of an entity funding music and marketing music, I don't believe it's going to go anywhere. That's my personal opinion. Yeah. You know, and I do think that whether you call it a record label, which the term in itself is a bit of an anachronism if you really think about it, but part of its functions have not been replaced by anything else. You know, like you still need somebody to identify and believe in talent. You still need somebody to fund talent. You still need somebody to market talent and provide them with a set of expertise and a team around them that enables them to create and become 
the next Dylan, the next Lennon. The to next be Lennon. clear, though, Pontus, that, that could be Chance the Rapper and his small team. It doesn't yeah. need oh, to be absolutely. a major. Okay. But, but if, I didn't say that yeah. it has to be a I just, I'm just clarifying. I know you don't yeah. mean that. I just yeah, want to I think that the opportunity of a new ecosystem coming up is a lot greater because of initiatives like this. Um, but which actors will come to constitute those new roles in the future, we don't know. There's a good chance that a lot of the current actors that are involved will just not be in existence in five or 10 or 15 or 20 years, you know, from now. And go ahead, Dan. Yeah, Dan. I, well, I wanted to connect your question to the prior question that seemed <laughs> kind of controversial. And I, I think it kind of hit the nail on the head because the self-governing community is happening. So when we talked about the strategic imperative for the RIAA, well, the same one was for the record labels. And we basically said, there's an opportunity now to participate in shaping how the community and the ecosystem interoperates. And if you don't participate, you're basically saying, Napster me again, okay? So it's actually happening. It may not be at this discrete uh, smart contract layer, but it's gotta start somewhere. And I'd say the community is already sort of self-leveling and self-governing in the sense that every ecosystem player joined. And we were totally surprised, really. I mean, we didn't think that many players were going to join. It's every component of the ecosystem. So I think you're, you kind of hit it. Now, the way it happens, you and George can sort of wrestle later. But I think as the interoperability layer gets defined, it will be portable and extensible. It doesn't need to rely on Hyperledger. It doesn't need to rely on Ethereum. Because uh, at the end of the day, that really doesn't matter. What matters is the data that we're sharing yeah. and how it governs the way we do transactions and pay artists and have, have an ecosystem that pays people. So and it's fair. Yeah. And then we swing the darn pendulum back. And if I could speak to and the- And we get more money in the labels. If I could speak to, to the well, label perspective. Yeah. Quickly. Interestingly enough, we had the policy summit at Harvard. All the players said, Please don't make open music some governing body for this and, and insert yourself as, as sort of the arbiter of what's right or wrong. And that was a clear signal that keep this thing technology focused. It's not boop. It's exactly. It's not about being a top-down organization. It's about you know, more of a, of a bottom-up approach. But anyway, Benjamin. It, it goes deeper than, than just saying that the labels are not going to be here anymore and that their function is not there. A label's job is to sign an act and get them to the most amount of people possible and extract the maximum amount of value to that label. It's their job. They, I, I've, sat, I've, I've been able to meet every legendary A&R executive I ever wanted to, and they all wanted to find that band, and they wanted to make them the biggest thing in the world, and they wanted 90% of the money from it, <laughs> and they were unashamed about it. And I sat with three of my friends eight years ago when we were founding Pledge, both of whom were offered record deals, and I said, under no circumstances should either of you sign these deals. This is suicide, you're dead. They wanted that one in a million shot. Took it, both career nosedives because of it. So I think we gotta look at what a label is now. Right? Labels have are big repositories of catalog that they exploit in bulk to digital service providers for money. Lots of it. So the labels are actually making a huge amount of money these days, just in a different way. And it's not going to the artists in the same way that it used to. So don't, I, I wouldn't underestimate the savvy of the people that got there. I also wouldn't underestimate them being Napsterized again, because I think that that's entirely possible. <laughs> but the most interesting thing, and, and you know, um, in developing dot blockchain, um, being in the working group in OMI, and working with the label, the label, the people that make the decisions at the label on a strategic basis, I think that, they want something they can say yes to in a certain way. They really do. They want something they can say yes to because what they're realizing is their lunch is being eaten for them by the digital service providers. You know, if Spotify's paper value is the same as the entire recorded music industry, something is wrong. And so one of the, the, the in the presentations I've done on blockchain, I was asked, so why would they do it? Why would, why would the record labels get together under the RIAA or not and figure out an interoperability layer, a data standard, a new format? Why would they do that? And the answer is because for the first time, there is more money to be made over the table than there is under it. Quite frankly, if you're stealing a million bucks, you're leaving a billion on the table. And for the first time, there are people smart enough and digitally savvy enough kind of permeating these, these structures 
that are saying to them, have you noticed how many people are on Facebook? Why do you pay Facebook every single time you want to post to it? That's insane. Why did, you know, so you, you're building your house on, on sand. And one of the things I think that blockchain will enable, but also this is happening in a non-blockchain world, is the artist is going to become the interface. There'll be multiple platforms and multiple ways of experiencing the content, but I think that what will happen is the stars of, in five or 10 years will deploy their media across multiple sources in multiple ways at rules that they set, and they will measure where they pound their attention based on what it returns them. Return on attention is something the artist will begin to measure every day, and if a blockchain-enabled format makes that happen, or if it's regular MP3s spat out at 1,000 miles an hour, the artists, I think, are gonna have more control and leverage because if something is great, there will be no barrier to stop it. It'll be frictionless. So we do have time constraint um, because I do want to get Marco to perform while you people can still stick around. Uh, Dan Ponis, closing thoughts? Nothing? I think so. I'm good. Okay. I, th I think we covered plenty. <laughs> I want to make sure that we are. Uh, oh, yeah, I want to get Marco up here. I want to make sure we get the whole agenda in. Yeah, so yeah. real quick. So, you know, in, in a dorm room that, that MIT and, and Harvard are both embarrassed to admit wasn't one of theirs, many years ago there was someone who, who stood up, to use one of Dan's terms, something called Napster. And, and Napster took music that heretofore had been this scarce thing. If I wanted the public enemy record, I had to go buy it, and said, that's ludicrous. Once music went from analog to digital, it became ones and zeros. It became information. And so let's spread it peer to peer. And that really was when everything changed. As we now sort of look at music as we must, and as I, the name of my course at Brown is in the book that I'll eventually finish writing, a canary in a coal mine that your industry can either learn from or be doomed to repeat, we see companies now in Ghana and companies in, in other countries in the world that are saying, well, wait a second, I've got these solar panels on my roof and I'm bringing energy in and my meter's running backwards. I have surplus. And so I'm gonna peer to peer that back up, right? This isn't fiction that might happen. There's a company out there doing it that I work with right now, right? And so this whole notion of scarcity and this whole line of sight that we can glean, blockchain's not limited to music, all the good points about finance, everything else. What it's doing is it's taking here to four tied down asset classes and unlocking them and then allowing them to spread. Somebody said, why do we put things up on Instagram? We don't get paid for that. Of course you do. You get a dopamine hit anytime somebody likes that, right? That's why you keep doing it. And that dopamine hit that music brings is maybe better than anything else, legal, right? And so spreading that around and finding new ways, whether it's through health, whether it's through environmental issues, whether it's any number of other things where we can atomize music and spread it out, and to my mind, use rule of law to enforce contracts so that artists can get paid and determine what fairness is, that's the grand vision. I think blockchain applies to music, but I think as so often the case with music, it is that canary in a coal mine and other industries are going next. So I appreciate so much my panelists and, my, and the attention here, and we got some music coming up from Marco, and to a point, Marco, if you think this is all ether, Marco, I did a project with National Public Radio because they got issues with music and podcasts, and we did a blockchain library on NPR, and Marco was one of the bands that contributed music to it. So this stuff is not ephemeral. So you were pointing to something, Marie. What, what, what did you? I was just wondering, was there another? I don't know. Who's the, who's the, who's the MC here? Not me. What do, what do we do? So I think uh, there was an opportunity to get a presentation from Benji on okay. what this looked like. Great, yeah. Do you want me to, or, or is it music time? Let's vote. Who wants music first? Marco does. <laughs> music wins.
here's a fact. If you're born in the United States, at the poverty line in the United States, so you're like the 15th percentile, because you're, you're poorer than 85% of Americans, you are richer than 85% of people in the world. 